African American criticism. African American studies finds its modern origins in the black arts movement of the 1960s, which dramatically altered North American attitudes regarding the function and meaning of literature, as well as the place of ethnic literature in English departments. The black arts movement established African American literature as a populist art form, while also spawning publishing houses, theater troupes and study groups. Often associated with such scholars as Henry Louis Gates Jr., Cornel West, Deborah McDowell and Houston A. Baker Jr., among others, African American Studies seeks to create socio-political awareness for various aspects of interracial tension and the relevance of African history and culture to blacks in the United States. Archetypal Criticism Originating in the work of psychoanalyst Carl Jung, archetypal criticism addresses a series of archetypes, myths, patterns, images, figures, symbolic cycles or dreams, in various literary forms. Often appropriated by the proponents of the new criticism during the early part of the 20th century, Archetypal criticism attempts to delineate patterns of plot or character and the ways in which they reveal what Jung refers to as racial memory or the collective memories of the entire human race. Hence, such primordial images impact our shared sense of human experience, our collective unconsciouses, according to Jung. Northrop Frye refined Jung's notion of archetypes in his landmark volume, The Anatomy of Criticism, 1957, a text that concretized archetypal criticism's place as a primary form of textual practice during the 1960s and 1970s. However, it was Fry's study of Blake, Fearful Symmetry, from a decade earlier, 1947, which, because of its insistence on matters of overarching, structuring, symbolic patterning in the work of the poet, did much to lay the groundwork for archetypal analysis. Moreover, Fry's work on myth and the Bible has continued to influence scholars. Backed in and dialogic criticism. Dialogic criticism has developed in large part from the work of Russian formalist critic Mikhail M. Bakhtin, whose theories of dialogism and discourse analysis have registered a significant impact upon the nature of contemporary literary and cultural criticism since the translation of his works during the 1980s. In volumes such as The Dialogic Imagination. Four Essays, 1981, Bakhtin differentiates between monologic single-voiced works in which a given culture's dominant ideology contradicts subordinate textual voices and dialogic, multi-voiced texts that allow numerous voices to emerge and engage in dialogue with one another. In his essay, Discourse in the Novel, Bakhtin argues that form and content in discourse are one. Once we understand that verbal discourse is a social phenomenon social throughout its entire range and in each and every one of its factors, from the sound image to the furthest reaches of abstract meaning. Bakhtin's theories of dialogism and carnival have not only influenced the direction of reader response theory in recent decades, but have also participated in the advent of cultural studies and a revival of interest in the analysis of the formal properties of literary works. Chicago School The Chicago School flourished from the later 1930s into the 1950s and was centered around the work of Ronald Salmon Crane. Drawing on Aristotle's rhetoric and poetics as their theoretical-based texts, the Chicago School believed, along with T.S. Eliot, that criticism should study poetry as poetry and not another thing. They viewed with suspicion what they regarded as new criticism's practice of rejecting historical analysis, its penchant for presenting subjective judgments as objective analysis, and its emphasis on poetry, rather than other genres such as fiction. Crane and others examined all genres drawing for their techniques on a pluralistic and instrumentalist basis. Many of the publications identified with what is regarded as the Chicago School, 
were produced during the 1930s as part of a ferment created by the radical reorganization of undergraduate education at the University of Chicago. Central to Crane's ideas and crucial for the Chicago School was the notion of pluralism. Underlying pluralism is a relativist approach that advocates many different forms of literary criticism, each of which has its own interpretative powers and limitations. The Chicago School, in other words, did not advocate one method, but several, to be adopted pragmatically as dictated by the needs of the given text and situation. Chicano. Chicana Studies. Chicano Chicana Studies finds its roots in a literary movement among Latino writers of the United States that has been gathering momentum since the 1960s. Such writers derive from a variety of Spanish-speaking origins Mexican, Cuban, Dominican, Puerto Rican, Central and South American, and have been establishing new stylistic and literary practices in order to express their own perspectives of life and culture in the United States. Much of the work of Chicano, Chicana scholars, involves the recovery of the rich culture of literature created by the Hispanic community in the United States since the 17th century. Chicano, Chicana literature involves a wide variety of stylistic nuances and textual forms, including, for example, a range of oral literary styles from stories and poetry to dichos, folk sayings, and pastorellas, seasonal plays. Cultural materialism. Cultural materialism can be defined as an approach to literature and culture, with these literary texts as the material products of specific historical and political conditions. Whether one speaks of the moment of production the plays of Shakespeare as mediations of late 16th century epistemologies and ideologies, or the reception of the text in particular periods, such as the teaching of Shakespeare in high schools today. In examining the relation of the literary to history, in which historical concerns are read not merely as the background or context of the text, but as being encoded in particular ways through the textual interests and discourses, cultural materialism shows how meaning is not timeless, but the differentiated product of different ideological and discursive formations, as well as of different times, locations and epistemologies. Cultural materialist analysis has often stressed the political functions of literary texts in our own time and, with particular focus on Shakespeare, the conservative appropriation of the playwright in the names of tradition and heritage. In doing so, cultural materialism produces analyses in which the fractures within conservative ideology are exposed and the subversion of authority is made available. Cultural Studies Cultural studies finds its origins in the British cultural studies movement of the late 1950s and early 1960s, particularly via the publication of influential works by Richard Hoggart and Raymond Williams. In 1964, Hoggart and Stuart Hall founded Birmingham University's Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies, an institution that soon became synonymous with the cultural studies movement of that era. Attempting to respond to the many facets of mass culture intrinsic to post-war British life, such theorists devoted initial attention to post-war shifts in the lives of working-class Britons, confronted with the changes inherent in modernization, as well as with the disintegration of traditional familial roles and social practices. Later manifestations of culture studies, particularly in the United States, critique the radical consequences of making distinctions between conventional notions of culture and society, and between high culture and low culture. Culture studies development in the latter decades of the 20th century is characterized by its intersection with a variety of disciplines and political forms of literary criticism, from deconstruction and postmodernism to gender studies and environmental criticism. Discourse Analysis
Discourse analysis emerged in the 1970s when critical and cultural theorists explored the manner in which language performs contextual and situational functions in the act of running or ongoing discourse. Discourse analysis examines the interrelationship between the speaker or writer and the auditor or reader in a given context with its attendant social and cultural conventions. Discourse analysis is associated with a number of theorists, including Hans Georg Gadamer, Michel Foucault, and Clifford Geertz, among others. Of particular significance is the concept of implicature, which was coined in 1975 by speech act philosopher H. P. Grice. Implicature refers to the inherent indirection in spoken discourse. Grice contends that we use such statements as means for sharing a series of what he describes as communicative presumptions. Contemporary discourse analysts discuss the roles of dialogue, stylistics and point of view in conversation and language. Ecocriticism. Ecocriticism names that area of literary and cultural studies which studies the relationship between human culture and society and the natural world. The earliest work in ecocriticism sought to reread canonical texts with a view to consideration of textual explorations and representations of the natural world. In particular, ecocritics addressed and analyzed Romanticism's textual debt to the idea of nature. Subsequently, after the initial critical engagement, Ecocriticism in the last decade has attempted to expand the canon through a rereading of nature writing typified, on the one hand, by Thoreau's publications and, on the other, the work of Native American writers. In the analysis of the representation and construction of nature in the text, ecocritics have also turned to matters of gender and race in their relationship to the discursive mediation of the natural environment, while, at the same time, reading the natural world in the text as the articulation of a non-human other. Ethical criticism. Ethical criticism's emergence as an interpretative paradigm finds its origins in the latter half of the 20th century and is often associated with such figures as F. R. Levis, John Gardner, Wayne C. Booth, Martha C. Nussbaum and J. Hillis Miller, among others. In scholarly circles, ethical criticism in literary studies functions both as a response to the post-structuralist theoretical concerns of deconstruction and postmodernism, as well as to the growing scholarly interest in the humanistic interpretation of literary works. The emergence of such critical movements as gender studies, historical criticism and culture studies accounts for the revival of ethical criticism which explores the nature of ethical issues and their roles in the creation and interpretation of literary works. The recent apotheosis of ethical criticism finds its origins in the North American Academy and particularly as a result of the institutionalization of English studies and literary theory in the United States. In European circles, ethical criticism has taken on entirely different theoretical dimensions and is often associated with the philosophy of Emmanuel Levinas. There has, moreover, been what has been perceived as an ethical turn in the work of those associated with deconstruction, particularly the work of Jacques Derrida, whose work is, in part, influenced by and a response to Levinas, though, arguably, the ethical dimension has always been at work. Feminism. Though not a unified single critical voice, Feminist literary criticisms are in broad agreement on their shared role as political and politicized criticisms, directed at matters of gender, sexuality and identity. Developing critical languages from the political discourses of the women's movement of the 1950s and 1960s, feminist criticism addresses the representation of women in literature and culture, in the work of both female and male authors. Critical feminisms have also concerned themselves with the role of the reader from a gendered perspective and with the study of women's writing. Feminist criticism has also addressed the relation of gender to matters of class and race, 
and has, furthermore, expanded the canon of literature through the recovery of neglected works by women. Frankfurt School. Founded in 1924, the Institut für Sozialforschung, Institute for Social Research of Frankfurt University, focused on the historical socialist and labor movements, economic history, and the history of political economy through a Marxist lens. It is principally with the work of Max Horkheimer, Theodore Adorno, Herbert Marcuse and Jürgen Habermas as expressions of a materialist philosophy, thought being the product of historical conditions that the Frankfurt School is associated and which has proved most influential beyond the immediate context of the Frankfurt School's inception and research. In addition to the influence of Marx and post-Hegelian leftist thinking, the text of Nietzsche left its mark, as did the sociology of Max Weber. As the second director of the Institute, Horkheimer sought to retain certain aspects of Hegelian thought while abandoning its idealism, the corrective for which was to be found in Marx's own work in terms of dialectical logic for the consideration of social reality. Adorno's work is marked by an effort to think the history of philosophy alongside the history of consciousness in materialist terms through sociology as the basis of a critical hermeneutics, cultural and intellectual objects articulating, in mediated fashion, the existing modes of production in society. Marcuse's work is more explicitly Marxist in its orientation than that of Horkheimer and Adorno. His publications include analyses of German fascism and the stages of capitalist development, a study of Soviet Marxism, and an attempted synthesis of Freud and Marx. Habermas, the principal figure of the second generation of the Frankfurt School, in his work, manifest significant departures from the interests of the first generation, particularly visible in his interests in speech act theory, a post-Kantian engagement with the reconstruction of the theory of rationality, and an open engagement with Anglo-American philosophy. Gay and Lesbian Studies in Queer Theory Gay and Lesbian Studies in Queer Theory as political and theoretical movements in academic circles have been influenced by the work of such thinkers as Eve Kozofsky Sedgwick, Jonathan Dollymore, Judith Butler and Alan Sinfield, among others. Many theorists locate the origins of the contemporary gay and lesbian studies movement and hence the emergence of queer theory in the writings of Oscar Wilde and Michel Foucault. Wilde's status as an icon of homosexuality and Foucault's intellectual theorizing of sexuality, shared in the construction of 20th-century value systems and in the creation of transcultural models of homosexuality. Gay studies as a social, intellectual and cultural paradigm finds its origins in the material culture of the 1970s, when the subjective politics of categorization began to assume ideological proportions. Marxism. Derived from the political, economic and philosophical texts of Karl Marx, even though Marx himself never published a specifically directed analysis of matters of aesthetics or literature, Marxist literary and cultural theories and praxis are concerned primarily with the relationships between literature, culture and society. Marxist critics seek to situate texts politically and historically, whether in the written forms of novels, plays or poetry or in other forms, such as film and television. Earlier models of Marxist analyses saw texts as simply reflections of society, basing this assumption on a possible relationship to the economic model of base superstructure determined in the text of Marx. However, this crude model of Marxist analysis has been abandoned largely in favor of a more complex comprehension of the political, ideological and historical mediations of the text. At its broadest, the influence of Marxism has produced in critics as sociological consciousnesses, Matters of materiality and ideology inform the interrogations of Marxist literary criticism in its various guises. New Criticism 
the new criticism came to be defined principally by the work of John Crow Ransom, Alan Tate, R. P. Blackmer, Robert Penn Warren and Clint Brooks, whose reading of literature shared a focus on form and on the individual experience of the text, rather than on matters of historical and cultural context or mediation. Implicitly rejecting historical and philological scholarship which was prominent in the 1930s in North American universities' study of literature, the new criticism exercised enormous influence on the study of literature until at least the late 1960s and, indeed, beyond that. The new criticism, emphasizing the reading of individual texts within an implicit framework of humanist belief, analyses texts with a view to showing the organic unity of a text, based on the careful explication through close reading of predominant thematic and vigoral textual elements. New Historicism Prominent in the 1980s, the new historicism emerged in North America as a critical methodology which politicized and stressed the intimate interrelationship between literature, culture and history. Focusing on a wide range of tropes and concepts, including figures of the body, incarceration and subjection, amongst others, new historicists read textual formations as the complex mediation of ideological, epistemological and discursive investments. While rejecting overarching models of analysis, new historicism addressed the question of text and history not as a relationship of text in context or foreground and background, but instead insisted on an understanding of the text as a privileged moment within a network of discursive and material praxis. Furthermore, the new historicism seeks to de-emphasize the conventional privileging of the literary over non-literary text, Thus letters, legal and political documents, journals and so on all belong to the network of cultural inscription at any given historical moment. While interests among new historicists are wide-ranging, what is arguably typical of the new historicist analysis is the focus in the reading of the text on the ways in which a text produces a subversive critique of dominant ideologies from the period in which it is produced only to find that subversion ultimately recuperated and contained by the conservative powers against which it is sought to act and articulate itself. Phenomenology. Developed from the branch of philosophy inaugurated by Edmund Husserl, phenomenological criticism treats works of art, such as the novel, as those works exist and have and are given meaning in the consciousness, perception and awareness of their readers or audience prior to any supposed objective reality. Phenomenology proposes a comprehension of the world which does not separate the subjective experience of the world from the objects experienced. Phenomenological criticism thus stresses the effective aspects of the text and the ways in which the reader's imagination develops awareness of and thus communicates with the text in question. There is both a linguistic and psychological aspect to phenomenology, which makes it available for literary criticism in particular ways, given that the reader's imagination and the language through which that interpretation is shaped govern perception as interpretation. The text no longer has an independent or universal meaning, and, moreover, meaning cannot be controlled by the author. Postmodernism. While there is little consensus over the meaning of postmodernism, it may be suggested, albeit provisionally, that postmodernist literary criticism is concerned not only with the status of the literary artifact, but also with matters of language, representation, identity, origin and truth. More sweepingly, Postmodernism has been defined by Jean-Francois Leidert as an attitude of suspicion towards the grand narratives of history. If history has always been written by the victors, postmodernist skepticism points to the fact that history is a narrativization and not a truth, and that, furthermore, there are competing narratives, none of which may claim any greater veracity than any of their competitors. 
although becoming an established, if contested, term for experimental writing by the early 1970s, earliest uses in English date back to the late 1940s as a definition for a style of architecture, and, subsequently, with regard to writings which exhibited aesthetics best described as anti-modernist and anti-rationalist. Part of the purpose of postmodern practice was to destabilize distinctions between high and popular culture, which much modernism in the arts had sought to emphasize and maintain. Subsequently in the late 1970s and 1980s, postmodernism became confused with the equally vague term poststructuralism, particularly the alleged emphasis on the part of the latter phenomenon with textuality and play. Leidard's The Postmodern Condition has been a key philosophical text serving to emphasize the politics of postmodernity, beyond the oversimplified assumptions concerning play and destabilization, within a purely semantic or linguistic realm. For Leidard and, subsequently, cultural and literary critics such as Jean Baudrillard and Frederick Jameson, Postmodernism named the hegemonic cultural logic of technologically advanced Western societies. In this understanding was incorporated critical response to the phenomena of post-industrial consumerism, multinational capitalism, and the role of simulacra and simulations which alienate the subject from any possible direct relationship to reality. It has been this turn to the political which has revitalized postmodern critical analysis in the last decade. Poststructuralism. Not a movement per se, but rather, initially, an Anglo-American perception of commons trends in continental thought, particularly in the fields of psychoanalysis, feminism, Marxism, philosophy, linguistics, and literary and cultural criticism, Poststructuralism names loosely the reception and deployment of these various diverse and heterogeneous strands from the work, for example, of Althusser, Bards, Sixus, Derrida, Irigaray, Kristeva, Lakin, as they have come to be translated and transformed through the Anglo-American theorizing of questions of the literary and the matter of critical textual analysis. The terms poststructuralism and theory or high theory have been assumed by some to be virtually synonymous, as have poststructuralism and deconstruction, and the salient discernible features in common of this so-called critical modality allegedly have to do with the following topics. The work of rhetoric, the destabilizing effects of language, the provisionality of meaning, the work of tropes and images in resisting uniformity or organic wholeness, questions of undecidability, discontinuity, the apparatic and fragmentation, difference and otherness, the constructedness of the subject, matters of translation, and the denial or, perhaps more accurately, a critique of the referentiality or mimetic function of language. Psychoanalytic Criticism Psychoanalytic criticism is derived, largely, from the work, first, of Sigmund Freud, and, subsequently, Jacques Lacan, although not exclusively. Particularly with regard to the complexities of the Lacanian text and its often contentious analysis of female sexuality, there has emerged a sustained critical interest in the stakes of psychoanalysis for feminism, particularly in relation to the location and constitution of the female subject within and by patriarchal cultural and psychic structures. The work of Helene Sixus, Luz Rigore and Julia Kristeva has provided much of the impetus for feminist re-evaluation. While there is no one psychoanalytic literary criticism, no single analytical mode, where the interests of analysis intersect is in the interest of the constitution of the psychic structures of the text, the text is read as giving access to psychic structures, not by what is expressed, but by that which is avoided, which is passed over in silence, which is articulated ambivalently, and which is focused rhetorically in particularly intense fashion. Moreover, 
for psychoanalytic criticism in its analysis of the textual subject and the subject or identity as textual, as constructed through layers of language, the interest is how the text operates beneath, and, often, despite what it appears to say. Themes and motifs central to psychoanalytic criticism are desire and loss, delay and repetition or doubling, forms of prohibition, lack, sexual sublimation or repression, and the sexual drive hidden within acts and events which are not obviously sexual in nature. Reader Response Theory Reception Theory Reader response and reception theory theorize that the responses of readers over a given period of time determine the various ways in which they find meaning and value through literary texts. Reader response critics contend that literary works do not function as self-contained autonomous objects, but rather as realities that become established by the readers who consume them. Theorists often conceive of this process as the product of phenomenology, or the emergence, via our shared consciousness, of the textual objects that we perceive. Theorists such as Stanley Fish, for example, conceive of the notion of a reader response criticism in terms of a given text's psychological effects, while other thinkers such as Norman Holland and David Blyke, Define the movement's aim in terms of the text's self reflexive and ultimately subjective possibilities. Reception theory or reception aesthetic refers to the school of criticism that explores the many and often divergent ways in which literary works are received following their initial publication. Joss utilized the concept of aesthetic distance to explain the differences between a given work's immediate reception and its contemporary profile. Joss argues, moreover, that this notion intersects with a given reader's horizon of expectations or the textual elements that impact the reader's expectations regarding the text in question. There are two principal schools of thought devoted to the manner in which reception theory can be applied by literary critics. The Constant School which includes such luminaries as Joss and Wolfgang Iser, maintains that the effect on the reader, who draws upon his or her individual experiences during the act of reading, should function as the literary critic's primary concern. The Geneva School, which includes such voices as Hans Georg Gadamer and Roman Ingarden, contends that a series of essential conditions, or a given reader's expectations about the present and the future, inevitably impinge upon our reading experiences. Russian formalism. Russian formalism is often associated with such figures as Viktor Shklovsky, Boris Achenbaum, Jan Ukarovsky. Yuri Taninov and Roman Jacobson, among others. Russian formalism resulted from the work of two groups of Russian literary critics and linguists, including the Moscow Linguistic Circle, founded in 1915, and the Society for the Study of Poetic Language, founded in St. Petersburg in 1916. Russian formalists eschew the notion that literature could best be understood in terms of such extra-literary matters as philosophy, history, sociology, biography and autobiography. Initially, they employed formalism as a derogatory term for the analysis of literature's formal structures and technical patterns. As Russian formalism's ideology became more refined, however, the concept began to assume more neutral connotations. Russian formalists as with the Prague structuralists who would champion Russian formalism's critique after their suppression by the Soviet government in the 1930s, argue that literature functions upon a series of unique features of language that allows it to afford the reader with a mode of experience unavailable via the auspices of ordinary language. Speech Act Theory Speech act theory has developed from the work of the theoretical school developed by J. L. Austin, author of the influential How to Do Things with Words, 1962. Speech act theory originates from Austin's notion that languages choose conceptions of truth or falsity in favor of larger, more significant claims, 
particularly ideas about the many ways in which language acts or functions in conversational life. Hence, performatives or statements that accomplish various acts do not serve to describe or inform, they involve the action-oriented first-person present tense, as opposed to the descriptive aspects of the past tense. Subsequently, Literary theorists have employed speech act theory as a mechanism for analyzing elements of dialogue, narration and linguistic action, while later speech act theorists have also brought to bear philosophical and psychological questions on the condition of utterances. The most visible moment of speech act theory came perhaps following the publication of Jacques Derrida's essay, Signature Event Context. 1971-1977, which offered an extended critique of Austin's absolute distinction between constitutive and performative speech acts, which, Dorita argued, became problematized when one took into account matters of iterability and citationality, by which all language is marked. Dorita's essay drew a polemical response from John Searle, reiterating the differences, a reply to Dorita, to which Dorita subsequently replied in the essay Limited Incorporated. A. B. C. 1977. Structuralism. Structuralism refers to the critical methodology that finds its origins in the work of a variety of French literary critics, linguists, anthropologists, psychologists and philosophers during the 1960s, including most significantly Rona Barthes, Gerard Jeanette and Algirdas Julian Gramis. Many structuralists were influenced by the discoveries of linguist Ferdinand de Saussure, who posited the study of signs as a form of semiology because of its attention to socially and culturally inscribed codes of human interaction. Saussure has had a significant impact on 20th-century linguistics and literary criticism, particularly his understanding of the verbal sign being composed of two elements, the signifier and the signified. Saussure argues that the fundamental aim of semiotics is to understand the concept of lang as a possible result of parole. For Saussure, lang refers to the basic system of differentiation and combinational rules that allows for a particular usage of signs, parole connotes a single verbal utterance, as well as the employment of a sign or set of signs is essential from what is ancillary or accidental. As the smallest basic speech sound or unit of pronunciation, Saussure's groundbreaking conceptualization of the phoneme represents a signal moment in the history of linguistics. It allows us to distinguish between two different utterances in terms of their measurable physical differences. Saussure explains the relationships between phonemes in terms of their synchronic and diachronic structures. A phoneme exists in a diachronic or horizontal relationship with other phonemes that precede and follow it. Synchronic relationships refer to a phoneme's vertical associations with the entire system of language from which individual utterances or, in regard to the auspices of literary criticism, narratives derive their meaning. A number of other thinkers participated in the emergence of structuralism, including linguist Roman Jacobson, who conceived of literary works as the result of a series of linguistic structures, Tsvetan Todorov, whose work on the fantastic remains extremely influential, and anthropologist Claude Levi Strauss, who was responsible for the widespread dissemination of structuralism as a theoretical concept. Aspects of structuralism were also influential in the work of Louis Althusser, Jacques Lacan and Michel Foucault, and the evidence of indebtedness to structuralism remains today in the various aspects of narratology, as exemplified in the work of Jeanette. Textual Criticism Textual criticism refers to the discipline frequently associated with bibliographical study that addresses the transmission of texts, editorial theory and the study of textual variants. Often drawing upon many of the insights produced by analytical and descriptive bibliography, 
Textual critics attempt to provide readers with explanations for alterations and variations that occur during a given book's textual production. Textual criticism's signal moment in the 20th century involves W. W. Gregg's important essay on the rationale of copied text, in which Gregg locates textual authority with the first edition of a text in the absence of revision in a later edition. Greg, R. B. McCarrow and A. W. Pollard established what came to be known as the New Bibliography, a movement that championed a text as a physical object and emphasized the study of the technical aspects of book production. Post-Marxism Largely identified as a movement with the work of Ernesto Laclau and Chantal Mouffe, and to a certain extent with the psychoanalytically inflected political critique of Slavoj Zizek, post-Marxism names a radical effort to move beyond orthodox models of Marxist critique through an engagement with the philosophical and textual interests of particular strands of critical thinking, identified as post-structuralist or deconstructive, so-called. Drawing from the work of Derrida and Lakin, amongst others, Laclau and Mouffe have privileged notions of difference and contingency in challenging determinist models of economic thought. They also provided provocative and often cogent critiques of tendencies within Marxism towards universalism, reductionism and functionalism, in the name of a pluralist Marxism. Although the radical relativism of Laclau and Mu's earlier publications, from which position they have partly retreated in the face of criticism, has been seen as problematic for the purposes of political praxis, 